saying goodbye to Big John. The aircraft carrier John F. Kennedy's decommissioning live from Mayport. Friday morning on Channel 4, the local station. Live from Channel 4, the local station, this is a special report. The Navy's final goodbye to Big John. The decommissioning of the aircraft carrier USS JFK. A spectacular day for an important occasion for JFK, Mayport, and Jacksonville. You are looking live at the center of attention, the star of the show, JFK, about to be decommissioned in a ceremony that is going to begin at about 10 o'clock this morning. On deck, the members of the crew, the sailors who will be manning the rails as the Navy says goodbye to Big John. Good morning, everybody. I'm Tom Wills with Stacy Spanos. And our special guest is Lieutenant Commander Dave Scalf, who's come to join us and help describe this decommissioning ceremony. Have you been to a decommissioning ceremony before? Never, never before. This is an honor and a privilege. And thanks well, for having me, by the way. I appreciate it. It's, it's our pl pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Nice to have you here. You're one of the people that's going to be intimately involved in bringing down Big John, as it were. You're going to be involved in actually helping decommission the ship and breaking it down. Tell people out there what the timeline is after today's decommissioning ceremony, Lieutenant Commander. Uh, yes, Stacy, the, the pace picks up pretty quick after today. After today, the ship, of course, will no longer be a ship. It'll be a vessel, and we'll start to inactivate this ship. We do that by looking at every space, and we have 2,000 457 spaces that we'll go in, inspect, and prepare for the inactivation. We have roughly until about the middle of July to do this, and at that point, it's the ship will be towed to Philadelphia. Uh, Tom astutely observed earlier, this ship has been around the world, and yet its uh, final pullout from Mayport will be pulled out by tug, correct? Yes, that's ironic, and it's also sad. It's a very sad day. But a very heartwarming day at the same time because of all the memories. This ship certainly is proud. It has served its country well and all the men and women who have been aboard over 40 years. It's staggering to think about what, what history they've witnessed. You know, if you think about it and try to put it in perspective, you can literally say that this ship has served in the 1960s, the 1970s, the 1980s, 90s, and into the 2000s. It's had 18 deployments, and I believe that you already know that. Yeah, 18 deployments Eight. since it was christened back in 1967. Let me ask you about your service aboard the Big John. You've had two tours, and one of them was pretty momentous because it was 2002 when the Big John was deployed to the Arabian Sea, and it took a, a, a very big role in, in Operation Enduring Freedom. Tell me what you did. Well, that's 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 correct. We were very, I was very proud to be there to, uh, first, but I would like to say that you know, we took out that day, uh, it was shortly after 911. We took off with a whole lot of pride because, you know, we had been attacked. We wanted to get to the fight, if you will. We uh, turned over the USS Theodore Roosevelt in the Northern Arabian Sea and struck the first blows of Operation Enduring Freedom and landed about 65,000 pounds on Taliban, on uh, uh, Al Qaeda targets. Mm -hmm. And that was impressive and was very satisfying for the crew. And you're right, it came on the heels of September 11th, Absolutely. one of the first ca aircraft carriers to respond, knowing the history of Big John and now knowing that it's going to be put into inactive status has got to be a, a little melancholy. A lot melancholy. You know, you look at the history of this, this carrier, like I said, it has helped, it has helped win the Cold War. It was off the, the, the coast of Beirut, off the coast of Lebanon. It was in the Persian Gulf during Desert Storm and, of course, in the Arabian Sea. You know, you look back at that, and I can see four out of the 18 deployments, all, of course, were very significant, supporting our national security and our allies. But there are four deployments, I think, that really stand out. The very first, uh, well, the third deployment in 1971, December 1971, went all the way to October 1972. That wow. was 310 days deployed. That was significant. And the 12th deploy deployment took place... Uh, uh, and the, uh, the highlight took place in the, uh, in the Mediterranean. When this ship, the FA-32, launched Tomcats to intercept Libyan-launched MiG-23s and, and shot them down. Shot down and two MiGs that down two. seemed to be threatening That's right. the ship. Absolutely. And then, and then the, the 13th deployment, as you mentioned, having the honor to go out after 9-1-1 after off the coast of, of Afghanistan in the Arabian Sea and deliver, I think, was the right thing to do, delivering that ordinance on the right spot, really put Operation Enduring Freedom on the map. And I think it helped ensure Americans, you know, that we we're going to take the fight to the enemy. And, and uh, 
So I'm very, very proud, proud of that. Um, I can't say, I would like to, to say this. You know, there's a lot to be said about the USS John F. Kennedy. You know, we can talk, talk about the nuts and the bolts and the screws and the, and the catapults and all those wonderful things that make a ship. But the truth is, it's not, it's not the elevators, it's not the catapult, you know. It's not the anchors, and it's not that four and a half acre flight deck that's U.S. sovereign territory that makes the ship. It's the crew, the crew All those past. people, all those men and women over that's all right. those years. It's just extraordinary. Channel 4, Sam Kavaris is joining us now, and uh, he's with the crowd, Sam, and uh, these people are very excited to witness this historic occasion. Tom, they are, obviously, and a lot of uh, former um, crew members of uh, JFK, of Big John, are here and making the trip here to Mayport to see the decommissioning here on um, on the dock. Interestingly enough, this is a uh, this is a, a fun and a sad day for so many people who spent m big parts of their lives. A lot of uh, people have come up. Uh, one of the master chiefs came up to me and he said, I, I think I've spent most of my life here aboard uh, JFK. Uh, a man who uh, has spent uh, a big portion of, of his career uh, around the JFK and was the captain at one point is Admiral Ed Fay, who joins us here live uh, next to the. Um, I guess we're right off the quarter deck here, aren't we? We're right off the quarter deck, right. Sam. You're right. Uh, this will be a this will be a, a fun and kind of a sad day. I know last night you uh, attended the the uh, dinner for uh, all the former COs, and you said 19 of the 30 were there. It was a wonderful night, and the camaraderie was as if we were all brothers from the same family. They're a great group of people, and a lot of people don't realize it that. Uh, Earl, Admiral Earl Yates, the original commander, uh, uh, the original captain of the Kennedy, is still living and was there last night. Oh, he gave a wonderful speech last night and a couple of jokes that had us laughing. I can't repeat some of what he said on the air, but <laughs> what a wonderful gentleman he is. And he did a wonderful job in putting this ship on the fleet and put it out there in great condition. And he's here to make sure it goes off in that way, too. This will uh, this will be obviously the last, last official ceremony for the Kennedy. And then what will happen? They'll actually... They won't drive the ship up there. They'll tow the ship, right? Yes. Actually, they'll uh, start preservation on all the equipment so that if it's necessary, they can bring the ship back into service on a very short notice. In order to do that, they do it here pierside, and they make it so that it, nothing will deteriorate inside the ship. And then, as they said, July, they'll tow it away. You obviously have a special affinity for the Kennedy. But what is it about the crew members uh, with the air wing as well? There'll be 5,000 or more people on board when, they're, when it's deployed. It just seems, whether it was the Forrestal, the Saratoga, the Roosevelt, the Truman, the Kennedy, there becomes a bond between those sailors and that ship. It's unbelievable. And I, and I tell you, you just don't know it until you walk down to the lowest levels of the ship and see those young men and women who are working like crazy night after day. And they are just the most motivated, mature folks I've ever known in my life. And they love this country, and they are the foundation that makes this country strong. It is amazing. I've, I've been on the flight deck during operations. Um, in fact, you set me off on a helo one day here. And to see 17, 18, 19-year-old men and women standing on the flight deck, literally risking their lives at every moment, just doing their job. And they were, they were unafraid. Right. They were well-trained by the people that led them, those fine chief petty officers that are out there. And they learned, and they learned quickly because they knew it's a dangerous environment, and any mistake could cost them their lives at any moment. Ed, thank you. Uh, Admiral Ed Fay, call sign FAST, who uh, currently works for uh, Northrop Grumman here in uh, North Florida. Great to have yeah, you back. Sam, good to see you Once again, again uh, and thank you very Thanks much. So much. Uh, Casey Black now uh, joins us here at the decommissioning of the John F. Kennedy. Casey? Yeah, Sam, we are up on the uh, flight deck now where we are surrounded by the crew of the USS John F. Kennedy. They're actually manning the rails right now, meaning they're going to be standing here uh, at ease throughout the course of the ceremony. They're only on the starboard side of the ship. That's in a chance to uh, be able to look over and see everybody sitting there uh, watching the decommissioning of the USS John F. Kennedy. There are about 7,203 chairs out there, so that's how many family members, friends, and visitors are going to be there. And, of course, you have to think about the ship's company too right now there's a uh, more than 2,000 sailors on board and you know what Sam we had the honor and the privilege to go up with the USS John F Kennedy as they left Norfolk and they went up to Boston we had a chance to ride along with them and we had an opportunity to see what you know some hidden gems on the Big John a lot of things that you wouldn't know existed unless you had a chance to find out firsthand by talking to the crew take a look at what we saw She's the third oldest aircraft carrier in the Navy. 
For nearly 40 years, Big John has been traveling around the world serving our country. But there's more to the JFK than meets the eye. Inside this four and a half acre floating city are unique features that make her unlike any other aircraft carrier in the fleet. Take the import cabin. When Jacqueline Kennedy was asked to design this room in the late 1960s, she told the captain she wanted real wood on the floors and walls, but he said no. The obvious reasons being because of the fire hazard. So in joking, uh, uh, Captain Yates at the time turned to, to, to Miss Kennedy uh, Ms. Uh, Jackie and said it would take an act of Congress, ma'am, to get wood on a warship because of the safety hazards involved. And she said, okay. There goes the story, several weeks later, it is written into law that the U.S. John F. Kennedy and any ships that bear its name will be allowed to have wood in their import cabin. And here in the forecastle or the front of the ship, the USS John F. Kennedy is unique compared to any other aircraft carrier in the Navy, and it has to do with her anchors. This is the only, actually the only aircraft carrier in the fleet that has a, uh, has a bow anchor. What it does is come straight out the forward part of the ship. And take the ship's seal. Lieutenant Commander Webster says he asked Big John's first commanding officer about that not too long ago. And what he told me was uh, he went out to the crew and he, he sequestered the crew to come up with a, a, a good seal for the ship. Based on all the inputs that he received, um, his input ended up winning the competition. And in the heart of the engineering room is one of the most mysterious and talked about things on the ship. It's something you wouldn't think would be there. It's more of a folklore type thing. It was passed down from shipmate to shipmate. On a bulkhead behind a ladder is this, a rendition of Rembrandt. It's painted by hand and by a sailor. The question is, by whom? The story has not changed about his pay grade, what watch he was standing, but just, like I said, the folklore is, why did he paint it? Why did it become so big? Where did, you know, why did he stop where he did? That's more or less the folklore of it. And still no idea who painted it? No, ma'am. And, of course, we will continue to have much more coverage up here on the flight deck next to the sailors who are manning the rails here. Uh, and we're going to send it now to Tom and Stacy. Thank you. If you've never had the privilege of seeing an aircraft carrier in person, this is a little bit like standing behind Goliath. If you took the <laughs> Modus building downtown and you were to turn it on its side, it would take two Modus buildings lying end to end to equal the length of the Kennedy. It's it's just, it's an incredible piece of machinery that you guys have here. It is. It's uh, 1,052 feet long. But again, it's not the machinery that makes the ship. It's the crew. And the spirit of the crew, I think, and crew's past and crew's presence and, and serving our country for 38 years, I think have brought this ship to life. And that's important. And I think over the past 38 years, this crew has served in keeping with the namesake's belief that, that every person in the world should be free to choose their own destiny. I want to remind you that if you're away from your television sets, you can watch the decommissioning ceremony live. We'll be streaming it on our web channel. It's newsforjacks.com. Channel 4 has a very intimate view of what's going to be happening today. You see these people walking behind me. They're on a red carpet, and you see that little area right here that's been set aside. This is actually where the decommissioning ceremony is going to be taking place. So keep it right here to Channel 4 as we say goodbye to Big John. The music move you every Saturday night now through April 14th. Join the celebration with live bands, beads by the handful, a spectacular parade, and more. Party in our own French Quarter with musicians straight from New Orleans to get your toes tapping and your hips swaying. And it's all topped off with live concerts from superstars like Sean Paul, the Steve Miller Band, KC and the Sunshine Band and more. It's the best 
to the Big Easy right here at Universal Orlando Resort. Mardi Gras runs every Saturday night from February 3rd through April 14th. You can book your Mardi Gras getaway, including hotel and theme park tickets for as low as $69 a night. Come let the music move you at Universal Studios Mardi Gras. That's the fact, Jack. Fact one, Subaru of Jacksonville is now a SoJack Supercenter. Fact two, Subaru's all-wheel drive event is the absolute best time in years to buy a new Subaru. The 07 clearance sale has come early and every outback must go. The 08s are on the way. Think that's it? Not even close. Get a $2,000 rebate on the 07 Forest Directs. Get $5,000 off MSRP on all Tribecas. Plus 0% interest. Plus take your shot for tickets to the big college basketball tournament finals in Atlanta. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Get the SoJacks now. Do you need to sell your home fast? Then call America's number one quick home buyer, 800 Buy Quick. Behind on house payments, too many repairs, tenant problems, relocating. Spell quick with a K and call us today. We'll make you a cash offer in 24 hours or less. We buy houses, any condition, any reason, anywhere. Sell your house today, call one Welcome back, everyone. Channel 4, the local station, reporting live from Mayport, where the decommissioning of the USS John F. Kennedy will start precisely at 9.59. The Navy never does anything late. Lieutenant Commander Dave Scalf here, along with Tom Wells. Navy's never late, right, Dave? Uh, never late. Never ever. late. At least they will not be late for this decommissioning ceremony today. This has been a reunion of sorts. Uh, for me, just being on the beat, covering the Navy over the past 10 years, pardon me, past 10 years here at Mayport, I've seen some of the uh, public affairs officials who come and set up stories. If it's, a, if it's a reunion for me, imagine the reunion for the others who served aboard the ship, Tom. It's like a family reunion, like a high school reunion, but it's something special because it's the military, because you guys served together in dangerous situations, never knowing when your country was going to call on you to go and fight. You're absolutely right. You know, Admiral Fahey mentioned the term brotherhood, and that applies to all sailors that have served together. You know, I had the distinct pleasure of providing a tour in, in uh, Boston, while in Boston. I didn't know the man. I I'd, I'd heard got his name from a friend of a friend. When he showed up for the tour, I found out, I soon found out that he was a retired commander that had served on the Kennedy in 1980. We literally walked the ship for two hours, and for two hours we rekindled, or he rekindled, and many moments he, he spent in tears. That's how touched he was oh, with Dave. memories on board the JFK. You know, they had a gathering last night that was uh, really remarkable. It was a gathering where if you said the word skipper in the room, you'd be talking <laughs> about everybody in the room because it was a reunion, a dinner of the former skippers of JFK. Now, there's one skipper who is the ship skipper, and he is going to be in charge, preside over this ceremony today, and we'd like you to know more about him. It represents the pride of the nation, and that, that's really what the JFK symbolizes. Captain Todd Zekin is the commanding officer of USS John F. Kennedy. He will be the ship's last. Uh, and when that occurs, I can't help but reflect back on the almost 40 years that this proud warship has served this nation and the crew members who have come on board and served her. Captain Zekin will end a long line of commanding officers who have guided the carrier through conflicts from the Mediterranean to the Middle East. I hope that I'm doing them honor by putting the ship to bed in the way, that, in the way it should be, which is with service, with pride, and with dignity. As the executive officer aboard the JFK seven years ago, Captain Zekin says he learned a lot serving on this warship. Be able to bring them all together and to make 80,000 plus tons of, of aircraft carrier and the aircraft that embark aboard her, focus on a single mission and accomplish that mission, that's what you take away. It's all about pride. It's about the uh, courage to, uh, to come up and rise up to the level uh, that, that sailors feel and the pride in their ship and in themselves and it's the commitment that they had to each other to ensure that when we came up here that we would show ourselves all properly. That's really what it boils down to. The captain's job as skipper of JFK officially ends this morning. His next assignment will be skipper of the Kitty Hawk and he'll be moving himself and his new bride to Japan as he takes over his new command. Sort of the life of a Navy officer, Dave. Well, that's true. The life, of, the life of a Navy officer should be flexible, and I think most sailors and officers understand that. But it also comes with many rewards. We have the opportunity to see the world, travel and serve in 
all kinds of different places and develop brotherhood relationships, not just with Americans, but with our allies as well. Yeah. Have you ever done any recruiting? Is that I have never done. <laughs> <laughs> He's a natural. But Is that you what could. You're saying? <laughs> well, you clearly love the Navy, Dave. I love the Navy. I've been in the Navy for almost 24 years. Wow, incredible there. And while we're talking about the sailors and the airmen and women who serve aboard uh, the aircraft carriers and the other ships in the U.S. Navy, of course, we can never forget the spouses and the families who also pull a big part uh, of this. I mean, they're, they're one of the biggest parts of the Navy, and I know anybody in the military would acknowledge that as well. Well, Sam Guevara is standing by. He is with the throngs of crowds who are uh, preparing to say goodbye to the Kennedy. And you have a very um, important person with you, Sam. You, you could say that, Stacy. Yeah. Um, here, of course, uh, the JFK has attracted an awful lot of people who served aboard Big John, but uh, one man who didn't serve but knew President Kennedy personally and was his driver, his yacht driver of the Honey Fitz when the president was on board in the Potomac, joins me here now, Blaine Price, who uh, 29 years in the Navy uh, as a bosun's mate, right? Yes, as a chief bosun's mate, yeah. And uh, you, you knew President Kennedy. Were, was that an assignment, or did he pick you to drive the Honey Fitz? No, I was assigned to it by the Navy. Uh, I went aboard during the Eisenhower administration and stayed for the Kennedy administration. And uh, just my billet for right. what to do in the Navy. <laughs> at, at that time. Now, you, uh, you served in the Navy 29 years, and your last assignment was here at Mayport and decided to retire in Jacksonville? Right, I retired here in 73. I didn't want to go leave Jacksonville. Uh, was President Kennedy uh, an easy guy to work for? Yes, he was. He was very personal. He uh, talked to you just like we're talking right now. And there was no uh, hustle or bustle or anything else. It was his pleasure yacht and he wanted to be treated just in the normal way. Yeah. Now, you have um, obviously a uh, presidential seal on your hat there. You're wearing the Purple Heart and the Bronze Star, I see. Um, this, uh, tell me about this uh, that you're wearing here. Uh, this is a White House service badge. It was issued in 1960, and it uh, stayed in uh, service until 1964 when they came out with the blue and gold one. So this is the one that I wore for Eisenhower and Kennedy. But the, probably the most famous memento that you're wearing is the tie bar, if you would show that to us and explain that, uh, what that is. Uh, this is a PT boat that was one of uh, John Kennedy's, and uh, it's got the name Kennedy on it. And he would give them out as uh, gifts to people what he would meet. I got mine that the day I made chief, he handed it to me. The president personally gave you this? Yes. So I still have it. How about that? That is something else. Mr. Price, it's a real pleasure. Thank you for being here today. Uh, Blaine Price, who uh, drove the Honey Fitz uh, for President Kennedy um, for three years, from 1960 to 1963. Stacy, Tom? Thank you very much, wow. Sam. The decommissioning ceremony is about to begin in just a few minutes, so please stay with us. We'll bring you every second of it live. Stuff where we always beat their price. Look at this sofa. I love this for only $2.99. And this queen mattress by Contour Pedic is only $2.99. Now y'all come on down to Sticks and Stuff where we always beat their price. Paula Sala is a real Geico customer, not an actor. So to help tell her story, we hired that announcer guy from the movies. When the storm hit, both our cars were totally underwater. In a world where both of our cars were totally underwater. We thought it would take forever to get some help. But a new wind was about to blow. With Geico, we had our check in two days. Payback. This time, it's for real. Geico. Real service, real savings. I'm Dr. Michael Silverman. I'm Dr. Alan Land. We've been caring for Florida residents and Medicare beneficiaries for over 50 years. As a geriatrician, I specialize in the health needs that seniors face. Floridian Care offers more benefits than the usual Medicare plan in that it covers Part A, Part B, and Part D. Floridian Care, a Medicare Advantage plan, gives you more than Medicare, including no monthly plan premium. Full Part D prescription drug coverage 
with unlimited generics. No co-payments for primary care doctor visits. And most importantly, you can schedule an appointment with any network doctor without a referral. But if you're currently enrolled in Medicare, you only have until March 31st to make a change. So call 1-866-684-3862 today. I may not be the Floridian care doctor that treats you, but that doesn't mean we're not looking out for you. Floridian Care from American Pioneer Health Plans. Come on down to Sticks and Stuff, where we always beat their price. Golly, these sofas are only $2.99. How about this dining room for $2.99? Now y'all come on down to Sticks and Stuff, where we always beat their price. Welcome back live to Mayport and the decommissioning of Big John. The Navy just gave everybody here about a five-minute warning that the ceremony is going to start. And this is a solemn occasion, and the Navy asked everybody to turn off their cell phones and their pagers. It's a little bit like church here, isn't it? It is. It is a somber occasion because what we're doing, we're taking a vessel that has served our nation for 38 years or so and removing her from the roll call. She'll no longer be at sea supporting our freedoms. That's a very sad day. She won't be a ship. She won't be a ship. She'll be a vessel. A vessel after that. This is a lot, you know, especially to the people who served aboard the ship. It's no longer a ship, just a vessel. Well, Casey Black is joining us live from the flight deck on top of the Kennedy with a bird's eye view of the ceremonies down below, Casey. Yeah, if you look straight up, Stacey, you'll see us up here. We're with the crew. They're manning the rails right now, which means they're standing side by side in their dress blues. They're on the starboard side of the ship in an effort to have all the visitors and family members and friends see them uh, as they're here to watch the USS John F. Kennedy be decommissioned. There's about 2,000 sailors currently on board. Many of them, if not all, already have orders to go elsewhere. So many are waiting to uh, be transferred to another location. Many are getting out of the Navy, but many are staying in because, of course, uh, they enjoy it too much. As far as the people who are going to be here in attendance, you're just looking at the seats there. There's going to be more than 7,200 people as far as the seats are concerned. There's 7,203 chairs out there. I just talked to one of the public affairs officers and they said they went out there and counted each one of those seats. So again, we're going to be up here on top of the flight deck with the sailors of the USS John F. Kennedy. We'll be checking in with you guys over the course of the JFK's decommissioning. Tom, Stacy, Casey, the remarkable discipline of the sailors standing along the rails. They're going to be standing there for about two hours, and the Navy is all about discipline. It's really quite an occasion, quite an opportunity for these sailors to show the viewing public what it is that they're capable of at a time like this. Yeah, absolutely, Tom. It's amazing. They've been out here for every bit of 25 to 35 minutes already, uh, but they were up early this morning. Reveille was at about 6 o'clock this morning. They've been here standing, uh, manning the rails for about 20 to 30 minutes. They will be at parade rest until the ceremony is complete, and they won't, will not move, will not talk, uh, of course, because they're showing their honor uh, and appreciation for the ship. And make no doubt about it, Casey, of course they know just how weighty of an occasion this is. Oh, absolutely. It's a really historical occasion. You know, this ship's been serving her country for more than 40 years. She's been here in Mayport for the better part of 11. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, Stacey, she's served her country well. Many trips to the Mediterranean, many uh, traps here on top of the flight deck. And, and really, this is a time that we're showing our appreciation for the ship and all that she's done for our country. Lieutenant Commander Scalf, if I could ask you what, we've got about a minute here, what is the first thing that we're going to see at this decommissioning ceremony? Tell me about the ringing of the bells. Right. The first thing that we're going to do, one of the first things, is, is uh, honoring the official party. And there is tradition to that, and it's also governed by our U.S. Navy, Navy regulations. Simply said is that you'll hear bell bells. Each official, each dignitary or, or officer will, is assigned, if you will, uh, a number of bells. The captain, for example, is assigned four bells. Mm. Concurrently, he's also assigned two, four side boys. What uh, is a side boy? A side boys are the, the sailors standing on the ceremonial quarterdeck. And if you go back in history, side boys were really in the days Good when... Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. In the days starting again, when ships were John made of Kennedy wood and men of steel. We'll get Thank you very much. Shall we listen in? Let's listen in. We'll be retired after nearly 39 years of service. Will the guests please rise and remain standing for the arrival honors, our national anthem, and the invocation. John F. Kennedy, attitude! John 
President F. Kennedy arriving. Mrs. Kitty Crenshaw arriving. Naval Air Force Atlantic arriving. U.S. Fleet Forces Command arriving.
Shaw, congressman, could not be here today, although there was word that he was going Hooray! to attempt to be here. The colors. And Congressman Crenshaw's wife in his stead today. The colors. Next, a Navy chaplain will deliver the invocation. Chaplain Rivers will now deliver our invocation. John F. Kennedy, Perry, present. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father and gracious God, thank you for life, for every day is a gift from you. We acknowledge that every turn of the propeller blade, every igniting of a boiler, every launch and recovery of aircraft on the USS John F. Kennedy over the past four decades have been accomplished by your hand of grace, and we thank you for your protection and enabling. As well, we thank you for the sailors that have served upon this great warship. Their honor, courage, and commitment are shown to be attributes from you and represent the very best of this country. We thank you that this warship has not only protected freedom worldwide, but has also reflected the best of our nation. May we as a country and Navy turn completely to you to receive your strength, character, mercy, forgiveness, and grace. May you bless and guide the leaders and the crew, as well as this country, as this chapter in the U.S. Naval history is closing. May we live for your honor and glory, for it is in the powerful and precious name of the Lord I pray. Amen.
Will the guests please be seated? Ladies and gentlemen, Captain Todd A. Zekin, Commanding Officer, United States Ship John F. Kennedy. Good morning. Welcome to the decommissioning ceremony of the USS John F. Kennedy. For 39 years, this mighty warship has stood the watch. Today, we are gathered here to bid her a fond farewell. Joining me on the dais today, Admiral Nathman, Commander, U.S. Fleet Forces Command, Rear Admiral Starling, Commander, Naval Air Forces Atlantic, Mrs. Kitty Crenshaw, Chaplain Rivers, thank you for that invocation. In the audience, I'd like to recognize Mayor Payton, his staff, Rear Admiral Miller, Rear Admiral Hunt, Rear Admiral Henderson, Rear Admiral Bonsall, former John F. Kennedy strike group commanders and retired flag officers, Admiral Chanick, Captain King, commanding officer, Naval Station Mayport, Captain Dobson, commanding officer, Naval Air Station Jacksonville, current Commodores and commanding officers, special guests from the city of Jacksonville and the state of Florida, and all the supporters of John F. Kennedy over the years. Plank owners, JFK alumni, family, friends, officers, chief petty officers, and crew of the USS John F. Kennedy. As you all know, the USS John F. Kennedy and her crew are extremely important to Congressman Andrew Crenshaw. He was prepared to, he was prepared to miss almost any vote for this ceremony today but he cannot miss a vote as important as a wartime emergency supplemental appropriations bill, which was rescheduled for 11 today. We are pleased, however, to welcome Mrs. Kitty Crenshaw, who will share the Congressman's thoughts with you. Mrs. Crenshaw herself is a, is a member of the Navy family, family and a sponsor of the U.S. Navy ship Stockholm and recently published author, author of the book, The Hidden Life. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mrs. Kitty Crenshaw. Thanks. Thank you, Captain Zekin. And Andrew, it was a very, very tough decision for him. He was up late last night trying to work it out to be here today. He was very sorry to miss it. But he wishes you particularly, Captain Zekin, wishes you well on your next tour as commanding officer of the USS Kitty Hawk. But we're here today to say farewell to a ship that has symbolized so much to so many. To the sailor, the Kennedy has been a home away from home on many deployments. She represents small town America, where many of her sailors are from. Her population is a little over 5,000, and she boasts a post office, doctor's offices, place of worship, restaurants that serve over 15,000 meals a day, employment opportunities, and she has elevators, runways, and a very busy airport. This carrier town represents the best of America. Sailors work together toward a common goal never separated by race, class, or gender. Ships are just steel, they're not alive. It's the crew who brings a ship to life. And the stories that emerge from her sailors will keep her spirit alive. The Kennedy, the Kennedy will continue to exist in the lives of the thousands of sailors who manned her rail, flight crews who donned a rainbow of colored shirts and made her flight deck roar to life and aviators who were catapulted into the sky praying to catch her hook on their return. To the Jacksonville community, the Kennedy will always be a symbol of our great city. She has meant much to this community and this community has meant much to her. Big John's connection to our community is more than just the economic base she provides. We'll miss her sailors and their wives and husbands We'll miss the children in our local schools and athletic clubs, and we'll miss their involvement in the Mayport community. To our country, 
To our country, the Kennedy has been part of our history for 40 years. She's one of the finest ships in the world's finest Navy. As our country continues to fight the war on terror, we well remember the roles that Kennedy has played in the conflicts of our nation's history. I know too that Andrew continues to stand in awe of the sheer size of this great ship and continues to be amazed at the organized chaos of activity on the flight deck. Kennedy also provided him with the honor of joining the national debate on how the Navy is going to meet the threats of tomorrow while fighting the budget pressures of today. Andrew will continue to work with the Navy leadership to make sure that we have the right ships in the right places for the right missions. The Kennedy is a great and noble ship, and when this day is done, she will cease to be four and a half acres of sovereign U.S. territory capable of launching an array of fighter aircraft and precision weapons to strike terror in the hearts of America's enemies. She will be stripped, docked, and viewed by most as just a great mass of steel. Her dedicated crew will be dispersed to other carriers to continue to perform their duties. But when those who served aboard her and when those in our community who loved her remember the glory of the USS John F. Kennedy, then our ship, the sacrifices of her crew, and the freedom she fought to defend will continue to live on and on. Thank you, Mrs. Crenshaw. I really appreciate you coming out today and being able to address us, address the crew, address our guests, and address the former shipmates on board John F. Kennedy. It is truly my distinct honor and, and privilege to introduce our next speaker. He's Admiral John B. Nathman, Commander, U.S. Fleet Forces Command. Admiral Nathman is a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, class of 1970 his naval aviator Wings of Gold in 1972. His commands have included Strike Fighter Squadron 132, in which he led his squadron in the first F-18 Hornet combat sorties against Libya in 1986. He had the LaSalle flagship for Commander Middle East Force during operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm, and the aircraft carrier USS Nimitz from 1992 through 1994. As a flag officer, he has commanded Carrier Group 7, Nimitz Carrier Strike Group, and Battle Force 50. In 2000, Admiral Nathman commanded Naval Air Force's U.S. Pacific Fleet, becoming the first commander Naval Air Forces in, two, uh, in 2001. He served as the 33rd Vice Chief of Naval Operations from August 2004 until February 2005, after which he has assumed command of U.S. Fleet Forces Command. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a true war fighter and a shipmate, Admiral John B. Nathman, U.S. Navy. What a melancholy day. Captain, thank you very much for your introduction, and Mrs. Crenshaw, thank you very much for your remarks. Your Husbands have missed, but you did a great job for them, and we want you to understand that. Thank you. For our distinguished guest, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you as we pay tribute to the crew of the USS John F. Kennedy and this warship, an aircraft carrier, a modern flat top, and the icon of American might and freedom. To the officers, men and women of JFK who stand here today, and the so many who preceded you, my personal Bravo Zulu. Each and every one of you have served the ship well and accomplished your mission. Missions that remain the cornerstone of our country's security. To deliver deterrence and to project credible power from the sea. This ship, teamed with their air wing, sent a clear, strong message 
wherever she sailed, demonstrating the power and the determination of our country and showcasing our Navy for the world to both see and feel. Well before this ship's keel was laid, President Kennedy said, in the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. And so to the crew, you have served with honor and distinction. Thank you. I commend you for facing challenges head on and for welcoming that responsibility. Be privileged to bear this responsibility. Wear it as a mantle on your shoulders with the pride it deserves. This ship's history and list of accomplishments are a proud reflection of those who built her, who manned her, and her namesake. The attention to detail and care in her construction in her more than 38 years of service at sea is a testament to the labor and skill of the professionals of Newport News Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company. After christening a night by Carolyn Kennedy in 1967 and commissioning in 1968, JFA conducted her maiden voyage and several of her subsequent deployments to the Mediterranean during much of the 1970s in response to instability in that region. In 1983, she closed on the growing crisis in Lebanon, remaining on station off its coast for most of that year. Her service throughout this period highlighted the ability of the American carrier striking forces to shape and influence regional security and apply force when needed, culminating in the display of her firepower in the Gulf of Sidra when she launched two F-14 Tomcats to intercept and destroy a pair of Libyan MiGs, delivering an unequivocal message to Libya's regime. A message also so eloquently delivered by President Kennedy. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend or oppose any foe to assure the survival and success of liberty. Shortly after returning from a 4th of July celebration in 1990 in Boston, JFK was tasked for a short notice deployment and in August, she surged to the Middle East, serving as flagship Commander Red Sea Battle Force during operations Desert Shield and Storm. Her embarked air wing, Air Wing 3, began the initial strikes to drive Iraqi forces out of Kuwait and flew 11,000 combat flight hours during her nearly nine-month deployment. Later that decade, she returned twice to the Persian Gulf in support of Operation Southern Watch. In her last show of force, Aircraft from her flight deck dropped more than 64,000 pounds of ordnance on Taliban and Al-Qaeda targets, a direct and lethal declaration to those terrorists. However, in my judgment, the legacy of this magnificent ship is found in her contribution in America's commitment to win the Cold War. John Kennedy summed it up best. It's an unfortunate fact that we can secure peace only by preparing for war. Although never firing a shot at the Soviets in anger, this carrier represented the capability of the United States to take the fight to the literals of the Soviet Union and win. Countless times, Soviet aircraft sorted in response to her presence, bears, badgers, and others. They took a look and ran. And who could blame them? At 90,000 tons, a full and loaded, combat-ready warship and crew would cause any country 
to pause and reconsider. And that's what she did. She delivered a powerful, consistent message to the Soviet Union and made them quit. To quote the former president, peace is a daily, a weekly, a monthly process, gradually changing opinions, slowly eroding old barriers, quietly building new structures. To maintain the peace, we have to deter. And to deter, you must have persistent presence and credible power. This is only possible by having aircraft carriers on scene, speaking softly and carrying a big stick. Just as JFK did numerous times, today our flat tops are responding to an ever increasing demand from our combatant commanders. Carriers provide access not available through other military options. The USS Stennis and Eisenhower are providing two carrier presence in the Central Command Area of Operations, supporting U.S. and coalition forces and increasing regional security and deterrence in the Gulf of Oman and Indian Ocean. In the Pacific, the USS Ronald Reagan has surged only six months after their last deployment to reinforce the Kitty Hawk in order to meet U.S. Pacific Command's requirements. And the USS Enterprise is now preparing for an upcoming deployment after returning home just four months ago. The value of the aircraft carrier cannot be overstated. Today, they go where they're needed because they can. Simply put, their demand is outpacing supply. With a future uncertainty, a trend of reduced access for American forces, coupled with an increasing traditional threat, meeting the global demands placed upon our carrier fleet will become ever more challenging. In this case, we will need more of these incredibly powerful ships. And now, in this final chapter, in a history that spans over five decades, the time has come to decommission the United States ship John F. Kennedy, CV-67. Her spirit will live on through the Kennedy family and the thousands of sailors who proudly served on board. This ship and her crew have served most nobly and well. With her decommissioning, JFK makes one final contribution to our nation's ability to maintain global peace and stability. She paves the way for a new generation of aircraft carriers. This is the Navy we must have in the future, one that can execute our nation's enduring missions. The aircraft carriers that follow in the wake of the John F. Kennedy will carry on the mission, the effects, and the reputation to provide the decades of deterrence necessary for our nation's continued well-being. More and more, I firmly believe the U.S. Navy's future will be more about preventing wars while sustaining the ability to win them. Captain, you, your officers, your men and women will move on to other important fleet assignments to deliver those decades of deterrence. Each of you is living up to what your ship's namesake said. Any man who may be asked in this century what he did to make his life worldwhile can respond with a good deal of pride and satisfaction. I served in the United States Navy. Captain, Godspeed, and may God bless you, your crew, and your families. Thank you. Commander, Naval Air Force Atlantic, Rear Admiral Starling will now present the commanding officer with his award. Will the military guest please rise? John F. Kennedy, Atten, The President of the United States takes pleasure in presenting the Legion of Merit Gold Star in lieu of second award to Captain Todd A. Zekin 
United States Navy for exceptionally meritorious conduct in the performance of outstanding service as Commanding Officer USS John F. Kennedy from May 2006 to March 2007. Captain Zekin set the standard for operational and leadership excellence, building and developing a premier team of 2,400 professionals that met and exceeded all operational and administrative requirements with his tenure marked by dynamic change, uncertainty, and significant leadership challenges of decommissioning an aircraft carrier. Captain Zekin created and maintained an environment of pride, professionalism, self-sufficiency, and a questioning attitude amongst the crew. His vision and focused leadership allowed the ship and her crew to recertify four boilers, repair a badly damaged rudder, and maintain fully certified bridge and deck teams, enabling USS John F. Kennedy to get underway and answer all bells whenever called upon. Throughout his tour, USS John F. Kennedy completed successful Norfolk and Boston port visits and four independent steaming exercises while meeting every milestone for decommission. By his outstanding leadership, commendable innovation, and inspiring dedication to duty, Captain Zekin reflected great credit upon himself and upheld the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service for the President, H.D. Star Starling II, Rear Admiral, U.S. Navy, Commander, Naval Air Force Atlantic. Admiral, thank you so much. It's not the commander who earns the medal, it's only the commander who wears the medal. It's the crew who gets them here. It's really the crew, and I've, I know most of us who have been to these functions before have heard that, but it is all true. It really is the crew who deserves it. But thank you, sir. I do appreciate it. Today's the day we decommissioned the United States ship John F. Kennedy. It is also the day for the final commanding officer to make his departure. In a true Navy tradition, I, I feel compelled to take a moment or two to thank the sundry people out there and the organizations who've assisted in making this such a seamless transition. I'd like all of you in the crowd, please, to first of all, about a big round of applause for the Navy Southeast Region Band. They've done a great job and will continue to do so even after the, commission, after the ceremony is over. Thank you, folks. I speak on behalf of all the past crews, some of whom are sitting with us today, by extending thanks to the Mayport Navy League, Team USO, Captain Bill Kennedy at the Navy Marine Corps Relief Association, at the Navy Marine Corps Relief Society, Captain Charlie King, I saw you out there, Charlie, of Naval Station Mayport. Each of you and your organizations have provided wonderful support to this crew and the memories that we will carry with us in our hearts of the sundry times we have spent together will be cherished for years to come. I know I, welcome, uh, I speak on behalf of all my fellow uh, commanding officers from the USS John F. Kennedy who are seated in the audience, certainly those who have been here since 1995, when I extend my thanks to those civilian pilots, Captains Jeff Eldred, Bill Steele, and Kevin Cavanaugh, and the remainder of your colleagues at the Mayport Harbor Pilots Association, you guys did a great job, a magnificent job of keeping us fair to the channel, off the rocks, and we didn't turn into a museum out there at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the channel. I'd also like to extend my personal thanks to the executive officer, Brad Robinson. You did a fine job. You couldn't have done it without you there, shipmate. Rick Haberlin, brand new navigator, stepped up, filled the shoes here when our last navigator had to transfer. He's pretty much responsible. He and his team have done a great job of setting up all these details today and putting it all together. The honor guard, the color guard, command master chief, and the 2,048 officers, chief petty officers, and sailors who currently man this great ship. Thank you, shipmates. To those who are standing out there, thank you. I will miss serving alongside such fine professionals. I'd also like to welcome my family and friends, some of who have traveled such a long distance today to view today's activities. Thank you for coming. I do appreciate it. 
But this isn't about a change of command, so to speak, because we're not changing command. This is the decommissioning of this ship. It's my distinct honor to begin today by taking a moment to recognize the former commanding officers of John F. Kennedy. Although we are blessed by only having 19 of the former 29 sitting out with us today, each one of these gentlemen represents two, over 200,000 sailors and crew members who have walked the decks of this fine warship, or currently do so overboard, Big John. After I read your names, gentlemen, I'd like you to stand en masse and receive the recognition from our guests. Ladies and gentlemen, please hold your applause until I finish reading all the names. First Commanding Officer, USS John F. Kennedy, Rear Admiral Earl Yates, September 1968 to September 1969. Rear Admiral Julian Lake, September 1969, September 1970. Rear Admiral Robert Gormley, October 71 to October 72. Rear Admiral William Gurick, May of 74 to November 75. Vice Admiral Diego Hernandez, June of 80 to August of 81. Rear Admiral Bruce Cargill, August of 81 to April of 83. Rear Admiral William McGowan, September 84 to May of 86. Rear Admiral John Moriarty, May of 86 to January of 88. Rear Admiral Hugh Wisely, January of 88 to May of 89. Vice Admiral Herbert Brown, May of 89 to December of 90. Rear Admiral Timothy Beard, March 92 to June of 93. Captain John Hutchinson, June 93 to January of 95. Vice Admiral Gerald Ho Hoeing, January 95 to July 96. Rear Admiral Edward H Fahey, July 96 to December 97. Captain Robin Weber, December 97 to August 99. Rear Admiral Michael Miller, August 99 to October 2000. Captain Maurice Joyce, October 2000 to December 0 2001. Rear Admiral Ronald Henderson, February 2002 to Febru April 04. And Captain Stephen Squires, April 05 to, to August of 04. Gentlemen, please rise and receive the accolades that you so willingly deserve and represent for the crew members who served with you. <laughs> Unfortunately, all the former commanding CEOs could not be with us today and and me even more so, unfortunately, some have passed on to a greater, a greater place. What a bittersweet day this is for all of us, but most especially for those of us who have served on board John F. Kennedy. On the one side, this crew, this wonderful crew, is allowed to show, allow the opportunity to display the fine lines of this mighty warship once again, and in this instance, one last time, to you before we strike her from the Navy rolls and put her in a decommissioned status. I was asked the other day, and I've been asked numerous times since then, what my emotions were as I prepared for today's evolution. And all I can say, as Admiral Nathman has already alluded, it's just a sublime, a sublime melancholy. We're saying goodbye to our fine warship, but more than that, we're saying goodbye to those years we've served together as crew members. I can only imagine the feelings of the plank owners and for those who don't know what plank owners are, plank owners are people who served on board this ship, who commissioned the ship in the first place, the very first crew on board. Some of those sitting out in the crowd are plank owners, and they've joined us today. I believe we have maintained the legacy proudly passed on to us by you to us, and it's a glorious life that we bred into, the, it's a glorious breath of life that we filled this ship with for these past four generations. Date nolidi regare. Give. Be unwilling to ask. That's the motto of the ship, but it's based on what President John F. Kennedy f said in his famous litany, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And for 38 years and six months, that's just what the pride of your nation has been doing on board this vessel. On 7 September in 1968, whilst this country was locked deeply in the throes of the divisive conflict in Vietnam. Then Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara welcomed mag this magnificent warship into the U.S. Navy inventory. She was commissioned by Jacqueline Kennedy, the late widow of our 35th president, and her daughter Caroline. Then the ship was known as CVA-67, or Attack Aircraft Carrier Number 67. 
After the introduction of the jet-powered anti-submarine warfare, warfare aircraft into the carrier air wing, the attack designation was removed. We are now currently CV-67. For the next four generations, in times of peace and war, her namesake, President John F. Kennedy, himself a decorated naval officer during World War II, would have been extremely proud of her dedicated service. This ship became one of the stout forward defenders of liberty. And I'm certain that President Kennedy's sentiments would have echoed those of our nation's very first president, who very wisely elicited the dictum, it follows then, as certain as that night succeeds the day, that without a decisive naval force, we could do nothing definitive, and with it, everything honorable and glorious. It's always been the ship, aircraft, and and naval stations that have made up our indefeatable combat navy. But nothing can be accomplished without the dedicated volunteers who man our fleet. And you won't find another group of such worthy representatives as those who stand before you today down here on my left and those who you're gonna see very shortly on your left. And those who've flown from our decks in the past who are not here today. Some were destined never to return again. The seas change with variations in light, swell, character, but for those who are drawn to her, either to sail or to meditate on the bright hues of a sunrise and sunset in the evening, maybe they do so. Maybe we're drawn to the that's from whence all of us come. And no more so than the sailors who have manned this ship. They are a profile in courage, the energy, faith, and devotion which they bring to this endeavor lights our country and all who serve her, whether in the maritime forces, the land forces, policemen, firemen, anybody who serves this nation. And the glow from the fire that we illuminate further lights the world in our presence. Today is about the honor, courage, and commitment of our crew. Their dedication to join a military at war or the integrity to remain ensconced in duty whilst life is in jeopardy is a true testament to their devotion. I have to take a side moment. For those of you who know, we went up to Boston about three weeks ago for a wonderful port visit. The weather was somewhat different than it is today. Today it's gorgeous and 70, probably a little hot out there. The last, the penultimate evening we were in Boston it was midnight, the winds were 35 knots whipping across the weather decks. The temperature was minus 21 degrees wind chill. We had some work going on that evening from midnight to 0500. The crew was out working, dressed head to toe. They looked like the Michelin man, trying to stay warm. We were rotating them on 15 minute watches. Not one of them complained. There was no balking, there was no whining. In fact, I had to order them within the skin of the ship to try and stay warm, just to get them in, because they wanted to get out here and take care of their ship. Now, what kind of dedication is that? And what does that say about today's, today's youth? I can't say enough about them. In preparing for today, it struck me that this ship is akin to having a relationship with a tried and true friend. When fully loaded, she has over 60 plus combat aircraft on board flying from her decks. That's our raison d'etre. Whilst they're on board, we launch them off of steam-driven catapults, flying combat sorties in harm's way, and then recovering in a controlled craft into the steel arresting gear aft. This strict ballet is accomplished in the clear daylight hours as well as in the dark, Stormy weather of an environment so loud, you can't hear yourself think. And all the time, it's accomplished by almost 5,000 American volunteers and those who are soon to become American citizens after honorable service. And their average, their average age is just over 20 years old. Her lifeblood is her fuel. The steam from her eight boilers propel her through the oceans. The crew is sustained by the nourishment from supply. Combat Systems Department allows her to see far into the distance. Operations provides the focus for her daily schedule. Weapons Department provides us with the means by which we can accomplish our mission. 
medical and dental, maintain the health of the crew, deck department mans the anchors, lines, and survival boats. The embarked arrow wing allows us to strike the enemy with the combined forces of naval aviation, superb, awesome, flexible power and might. We are a living, breathing creature. And we do this 24-7, 365. These superb patriots that you see here have been doing this from the first plank owner to the last person who marches off this ship today for 40 years. The baton of service has been handed down to us by those sailors who went before and rode the waves in search of adventure, challenge, and a draw to the sea that only those who spend their lives on the oceans can understand. Our legacy comes to us from them, and we thank you for passing us down this magnificent machine. We couldn't have done it without you. Nobility of purpose, service to a people, devotion to a cause, and a deep belief in each other is what sustains us. But we couldn't have done it without the support from family and friends who stayed behind, showering us with love and concern from afar as we deployed over 18 times to the 2nd Fleet, 6th Fleet, and 5th Fleet. Some, some of those deployments were routine. Presence that we displayed, and sometimes whilst carrying the fight to enemies of freedom and those who would sustain aggression. Such were the cases off Lebanon in 82, as Admiral Nathman mentioned, Libya in 89, Desert Storm in 91. Each time the clarion call to arms sounded forth and reverberated off the welkin, this ship responded to duty. We do not fight because we enjoy it. We fight to maintain the way of life that all of us have come to understand and cherish. To paraphrase our namesake, we did not come to curse the darkness, but we came here to light a candle for others to be led out of the darkness. Those words could have no more meaning than they do today. But none of those previous calls to arm had the same dramatic sense of honor, courage, and commitment as our men and women did on that infamous day in September 2001. Then I was executive officer on board John F. Kennedy. At here, getting underway that morning for routine operations. And as we twisted in the channel and got, as we twisted in the basin and got fair to the channel, we all stared in horror at the Holocaust that engulfed our, our fellow citizens in New York, Pennsylvania, in Arlington. This world was stunned by the assault on our country. But as seaborne warriors assigned to this warship, we went to general quarters, stood to our posts, and prepared to defend as called upon. Subsequently, this ship launched airstrikes in support of operations enduring freedom and Iraqi freedom. We did not do that so much, again, as to curse the darkness, as to bring light and to spread the sense of freedom throughout the world. The commanding officer of a warship is in a unique position. He sits on the bridge and observes a stellar performance of all those moving parts that go into making this floating Marshall City operate. Although the captain is held ultimately responsible and accountable, he doesn't do it alone. Together, and as part of an unbeatable team, we blend capability and ability from across a wide network, network of lands and peoples. Brought together here, they forge their metal into an unbeatable combat team. A commander's heart swells with pride every time he sees the way these magnificent men and women rise to all occasions. There's no way I could adequately convey the true sense of appreciation to all of the crew members who are arrayed here and those who've gone before some to the ultimate home port to drop anchor no more. It would move the heart of the, even the staunchest cynic to see the way these true shipmates handle themselves under pressure. A couple of weeks ago, I presented the, the national ensign that had flown over this ship to Caroline Kennedy in Boston. It struck me at that time, the common link we had, that fine lady is my age, and I remember those dark days in 1963. And I remember what we have done as a Navy since then and what she has done to support us on board John F. Kennedy. And that common link was drawn at that moment from her through me to this crew. Earlier in that day, we had had a ceremony on board this ship in the hangar bay behind me for about 1,300 people where we, whereby we inducted over 300 20 new citizens of the United States into our roles. 
Although we didn't do it on that day, I'd like to read an email from one of the chief petty officers who's standing down before you on your right. He sent me this email yesterday, and I'm going to read it to you verbatim. Captain, I know you will be very busy tomorrow, but I just want to share my sentiment with you on how I feel towards this great ship of ours. I spent close to four years on this ship, and as the day approaches and putting this ship to rest after 38 years of faithful service, I cannot help in reflecting all the wonderful things that this ship has done for our great nation. I am sure that I and the majority of the crew, both present and past, who have sailed with this ship will be choked up tomorrow as we reflect and remember the event. I'm sorry, remember the sweat, the tears, and the sacrifices many have made to assure that liberty and our way of life is secured. Growing up in Papua New Guinea, I would never have dreamt in joining the Navy, let alone sailing on board this majestic vessel. Sir, it will always be my honor to have served with you and to have the opportunity to sail this wonderful ship of ours named the USS John F. Kennedy. That's a shipmate. There's a notable difference between civilian friends and shipmates. And I've tried to get this point across to our crew members. Civilian friends get upset if you're too busy to talk with them for a week. Shipmates are glad to see you after years and will be happily carry on the same conversation you had with them the last time you met. Civilian friends call your parents Mr. and Mrs. Shipmates call your parents mom and dad. Civilian friends have never seen you cry. Shipmates cry with you. Civilian friends know a few things about you. Shipmates could write a book with direct quotes from you. Civilian friends will leave you behind if that's what the crowd is doing. Shipmates will kick the crowd's butt if they leave you behind. Civilian friends are for a while. Shipmates are for life. Civilian friends have shared a few experiences. Shipmates have shared a lifetime of experiences no one else could ever dream of. Today, shipmates, we say farewell to this proud fighting lady who has served and has served us so well. The fires in Two Alpha Boiler were pulled for the final time at 1438 Eastern Standard Time, 10 March 2007, and the plant is now cold. There's no more aroma of baking bread on the mess decks, no more overall lines or anchors away. The radars no longer track targets. There's no longer the hustle and bustle of all hands moving about the brows and the flight deck is silent. The hunters have already flown home from the hills and the sailor must now come home from the sea. I only wish to leave you with one final thought. As Admiral Nathman already mentioned, we will both quote the namesake of this vessel. I can imagine no more rewarding a career and any person who may be asked in this generation what they did to make their life worthwhile I think can respond with a good deal of pride and satisfaction. I served in the United States Navy and aboard the United States ship John Fitzgerald Kennedy. I will now read my orders. John F. Kennedy, Atehu! Buper's order 0617, official change duty orders for Captain Todd Allen II, U.S. Navy. When directed by reporting senior, detached CV-67, USS John F. Kennedy, and report to CV-63, USS Kitty Hawk. Sir, I request permission to decommission the United States ship John F. Kennedy. Permission granted, Captain. Very well. Gentlemen, if you'll follow me, please. Will the guests please rise? for the honors departure of the official party. ceremony coming to a conclusion the officers and congressman Andrew Crenshaw's wife Kitty 
leaving John F. Kennedy. <laughs> Lieutenant Commander Dave Scalf is here with us watching this ceremony. Dave, I'd love to know your reaction to the speeches and to what you've just witnessed. This is your first decommissioning. Very, very touching, Tom. I gotta tell you, I too spent many years on this. U.S. Fleet Forces Command. I was standing on Elevator 2 on 9-11 with Captain Zekin. He was the executive officer at the time. And we all stood in awe and shock that day. We pulled out that morning knowing we'd leave our families behind. But we pulled out as a team. And it's those kind of memories that will bond all of us, this crew and the crews of past together. And that's why it's a Naval sad Air day. Naval Air Force, Atlantic, the party. And just as they were escorted onto the ceremonial deck here, Kitty, they were being escorted off. off. Yes, please be seated. And Lieutenant Commander Scalf, even though permission was granted to decommission, there's much more to the ceremony. The flags have to actually have to be lowered, too. Well, we're about to enter about nine or ten minutes where we actually go into the ceremony and have an, uh, an opportunity to witness the symbols, the symbols that take place prior to a decommissioning. There are several things that are going to take pay place. In just a moment, the captain will give the command to lay the ship ashore. Executive officer, lay the crew to shore. Aye, aye, sir. John F. Kennedy, debark the ship. This is the first phase of the process of decommissioning. What you see today is the, cr the crew, when the captain says, John F. Kennedy barked the ship, he's saying for the last time, crew, leave the ship. And what will happen as you watch this procession, the command master chief, Master Chief Toussaint, will lead, lead the sailors off the ship. He will take his place in front of the color guard. And once I mean, keep in mind this could be a lengthy process simply because there are still about 2,000 sailors still on the John F. Kennedy. But really, is there, I was wondering, somebody who disembarks last? There is, and that will be our Sailor of the Year. And I'd love to speak to him uh, in moments, but I would like to point out something very important about the Command Master Chief, Master Chief DeSantis. He'll take his place, as I mentioned, as he should, in front of the, uh, the Honor Guard. The Command Master Chief is the primary advisor to the commanding officer on all enlisted matters. And in most in all commands, the Command Master Chief fills a very critical and unique position. He has the responsibility of assisting the commanding officer in maintaining good order and discipline and still taking care of the sailor. We have the privilege of having a fabulous Command Master Chief and Master Chief Desantis. After this, after the formation, gets to the, the pier, you'll see the hangar bay doors close, and you'll see the radar stop. The closing of the doors, and when the radar stops, symbolizes that the functions and the capabilities of this great ship ceased. Soon after that, the captain. The captain will give the order, strike eight bells. And that's a traditional term. In simple terms, what it really refers to is completing a four-hour watch safely. But with regards to what's happening today, it means that no longer will we stand watches on board the John F. Kennedy. The watches on board the John F. Kennedy are finished. So in the past 38 years, there has never been a moment like this, correct? Absolutely not. This is the beginning of the end. We have minutes, literally minutes left in the life of this ship. And that's what's so sad. The captain will also announce, give the order to haul down the colors. And what he's telling the crew at that time is to bring down the ensign on the fan bell, bring down the Union Jack, and bring down the commission pennant on the 
on the mast. And later in the ceremony, the executive officer will elaborate on the significance of bringing down the commissioning pennant. But in very simple terms, it means that we remove the USS John F. Kennedy from the active role. It's no longer a ship. Will any of these sailors sneak back on board for one more final look, or are they stepping off that ship for the last time, never to go back? Most of these sailors will step off for the very last time. This is what I... Truthfully, truthfully, we still have work to do, and that will begin starting tomorrow. Some, some sailors are coming in tomorrow to make that eventual move from the ship to our living quarters on the barge. That's and from interviewing Captain Todd Zekin earlier, the commanding officer, he said Tuesday, I guess the civilian contractors are going to be come in, coming in to start dismantling parts of the ship. And that work will take several weeks. And then towards the end of July, according to Captain Zekin, is when the JFK will... Will it be longer, any longer the JFK? It will be a vessel. A vessel. We'll still call her Big John because yeah. <laughs> she bore sentimental. That's when that, the vessel will actually be moved out, towed out, to a, a shipyard in Philadelphia. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. And in between now and then, the crew will transfer. A lot of the crew will transfer. Our numbers diminish monthly in, in big numbers. But nonetheless, we still have enough crew members on board to get the job done. That is ready this ship for the eventual transfer or towing to Philadelphia. These sailors who are disembarking now, how long will it be before all of them will have their orders to their next job? Well, believe it or not, some of these sailors are leaving as early as next week. They already know where they're they going? They already know where they're going. You know, we had a, a wonderful opportunity. This is a good example of how the Navy takes care of its sailors. This crew waited for a year for a final decision on when we were going to decommission. The Navy said, you know, we're going to take care of these shipmates and we're going to send a decom crew uh, to, a, to provide orders for every sailor on board. And I can tell you that in one week, Bupers, the Naval Bureau of Personnel, wrote 1,498 orders for our sailors. And there was literally, I can count on two hands, a number of sailors who did not have orders at that time. Since then, I believe they do. Tremendous, tremendous dedication to our sailors. I enjoy it. One of the things that struck me that uh, Captain Zekin mentioned in his speech was that he got an email from one of the sailors on board, and I found it interesting that the sailors have that opportunity to communicate with the skipper of the ship. Well, the truth is, any sailor has an opportunity to speak to the captain. You can do it via an email, you can do it through your chain of command with a simple request. Uh, we have an internet system on board, a LAN on board, that allows us to share email. So I would not be surprised if he was not the only uh, sailor mm. that expressed their heartfelt desire and thanks and gratitude for having an opportunity to serve on this great ship. Are your civilian friends going to have their feelings hurt now that uh, <laughs> the captain has laid out exactly the difference between a civilian friend and a shipmate? You know, I think they'll get over it. I think they understand completely. Very interesting to hear. Your civilian friends will call your mom and dad, Mr. and Mrs., but your shipmates will call them mom and dad. Is that really the bond that forms? I, I don't come from a military background, but just knowing people who have been in, it seems like there's such a sense of honor and family amongst you. Um, I'll give you an example, and this is a true story. It just happened this past Sunday. I've had an urge to call a friend for about six months. I haven't been in touch with him for over six months, and I just couldn't get, I couldn't get over it. I picked up the phone and I got, got through to him and he said, Dave, I've been thinking about you. Huh. Oh, we my. talked for about an hour and a half. It was touching. But that's a relationship that you build, build when you serve together. Dave, your aviation maintenance, that's your line of work. What exactly will be your job as, as the ship, now vessel, is uh, prepared to make this trip to Philadelphia? Well... My, my main focus will be concentrating on closing out the spaces on the ship. And initially what we'll do is we'll put teams together and we'll go through every space on board the ship to inspect it and sometimes make minor repairs in order to, in order to turn it over to uh, Philadelphia. We are watching still the procession of sailors filtering off the ship. We've gotten quite a crowd down below, Dave, but we can see that there are quite a few more to come. And the amount of discipline that they all showed while they were manning the rails and the gentlemen who are down here uh, in the hot sun today, uh, the, 
and pomp and circumstance is truly amazing to someone and to others who have never really seen the discipline exhibited by people in the military. You know, I think even though this is a somber day, the crew as a whole is motivated, is motivated to be here today and take part in this very special occasion. I can tell you also that we have practiced Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. So I think we're acclimatized to the weather right now. You know, it's, uh, it's a fact of life, whether it's um, a happy fact of life or a sad fact of life. I'll leave that to everybody else's opinion. But, Dave, as you know, there are many Americans who are blithely unaware of exactly what you all do. Does that ever bother you? you no, it does not. It does not because when I have an opportunity to go to places like Boston, who really doesn't have a Navy presence, and you have people that come in droves to say thank you for what you do, even though they may not know what you do, that makes me feel good. And despite a public that may not know the details of what we do, I firmly believe that the public appreciates and respects what we do. Well, I have to tell you, at this juncture, we still have a ways to go, but it, we really, at Channel 4, it is our privilege to bring to our audience this decommissioning ceremony and the remarks that were made. And you know, we haven't talked about the Cold War very much since 2001. We haven't talked very much about the Soviet Union. Deterrence is a word that you just don't hear anymore, whereas we used to hear it all the time in the, in the 60s and the, and, and the 70s. And to be reminded again about the job that you all did without ever firing a shot by just providing that deterrence. And I know that was drilled into each and every single sailor who was involved in those years. That is so true. I, I have to say that if you really look at the conflict and the combat that our naval vessels have amassed over the years, it's minuscule. It's minuscule to the number of days and hours and months of sea that we've steamed, simply showing, projecting our power, waving our flag, and being there off the coast. I thought it was interesting to hear the brass stress the fact that the Navy is by no means getting out of the aircraft carrier business. I mean, the Admiral even sort of seemed to be saying, you know, we don't need fewer aircraft carriers, we may need more aircraft carriers. I don't want to get into politics here with uh, you, okay, but no. he, he delivered a message. The message, is, the message is really this, is that the Navy has a plan to put to sea 313 ships and part of that plan is to increase the carrier battle uh, force. We will have new carriers on the horizon. And really, the aircraft carriers have revolutionized the way wars are fought, the way conflicts are suppressed, because you, in essence, have a floating airport where you can go to and, and launch uh, fighters at, at a moment's notice. And well, the bottom line is this aircraft carrier has more firepower than some countries. I believe it. And that really puts it into perspective, Dave, when you yes. say it that way. USS uh, George Herbert Walker Bush will be the next aircraft carrier. Can you tell us the difference between a state-of-the-art nuclear carrier, the Bush, and this ship that's being decommissioned? The biggest difference is the Bush will be a nuclear-capable ship, and this obviously is a, is a fossil ship. <laughs> but in terms of comfort uh, to the sailors and whatnot, pretty much along the same lines, correct? There, it won't be all lavish like a cruise ship that many of us think of. No, no, the ship is built first and foremost to complete a mission. Correct. That's the, that's the biggest reason we put these ships together. I do know that we have berthing areas in newer ships that afford a little more room, you know, a little more detail for the sailor. And I have been on board, not the JFK, but on another ship, and what brings, what comes to mind for me is actually going up and down uh, those narrow hallways and those staircases as well. If you've never been on one, you really can't imagine how steep those staircases are. <laughs> it's quite a workout every day. Considering our, our navigator, the, na uh, the nav navigation officer works, his office is in the O10 level. O10 level. O10 level. Which is... And he climbs it every day, five or six times a day. You're that's, pointing... I'm sorry, that's well, well above the bridge. My goodness. Yes. Incredible. Well, tell me again... Does he get us something extra in his pay envelope for climbing up and down those stairs? <laughs> Well, it keeps them in shape for our <laughs> semi-annual PT, that's for sure. Tell me again about the Sailor of the Year chosen as the last person to exit the ship. Well, what I was getting to is the Sailor, year, sailor of the Year will be the sailor who, who will take the ensign once the ensign is, is drawn down, is hauled down. He will take that ensign and he will deliver it to the Command Master Chief. Now, our Sailor of the Year is the top sailor on the board, the John F. Kennedy. His name is 
Cadelser Johnson, ET1 Johnson. And he represents our Navy Corps values, honor, courage, and commitment. He's also distinguished himself by performing very, very well in sometimes challenging and, and, and tough situations. And also, he's one of these sailors who's taken upon himself to, to professionally enhance himself by attaining qualifications and school, going to school for, a, for an extra education. So we have sailors, I, I, we point him out as, as our flagship sailor. But the truth is, if you look about this ship, you'll find hundreds and hundreds just like him. Do his shipmates nominate him? Was he chosen by the, the CO? Is a sword. The Very chief well. petty officer is nominated. Strike eight bells. Hold down the colors. Alan F. Kennedy, freeze it. Arm let us now observe a moment of silence for those servicemen and women who have made the ultimate sacrifice. During the Middle Ages, the mark of the knight and other nobles was a coach and whip pennant, called a pennon. The size of these pennons, as well as their diverse splendor, usually signified the relative rank and importance of the noble it heralded. During the infancy of modern naval sea power, these nobles rarely embarked upon seagoing vessels. But when they did, they flew their pennons from the most visible place on the ship, usually the forecastle or the mainmast. At the moment when a commissioning pennant is broken at the masthead, a ship becomes a Navy command in her own right and takes her place alongside other active ships of the fleet. Once in commission, the commanding officer and crew are entrusted with the privilege and the responsibility of maintaining their ship's readiness in peace and of conducting successful operations of, at sea in time of war. Hauling down the commissioning pennant signifies the end of a ship's active service. At this time, our Senior Sailor of the Year, Petty Officer First Class Johnson, will deliver the ship's ensign and the commissioning pennant to our Command Master Chief, Chuck DeSance. The Command Master Chief will in turn receive the pennant and the ensign and march the ensign and the pennant to the ceremonial brow and deliver them, deliver them to the commanding officer. Ladies and gentlemen, you may be seated.
Secure the watch. The ship's deck log is the official daily record of a ship. It chronologically describes every circumstance and occurrence of importance or interest which concerns the operation and safety of the ship or which may be of historical value. Accuracy in describing events recorded in the deck log is essential, as entries often constitute important legal evidence for incidents involving the ship and its crew. At this time, 1100 hours and 16 minutes local, the commanding officer will sign the last entry into USS John F. Kennedy's ship's log on this date, 23 March 2007. Dave, is there any part of the ship that the average sailor might take home with him as a keepsake, a knife, fork, or a spoon? Do you guys do that kind of thing? Well, honestly, not officially, no. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate your honesty. Not officially, okay. No, there are definitely keepsakes that the sailors have worked with in their shops that they would take home. That certainly would, wouldn't be detrimental to, uh, to the ship. John F. Kennedy, departing. Sir, the watch is secured. United States ship John F. Kennedy is decommissioned. I relinquish my command. Very well. Chaplain Koch will now deliver the benediction. Heavenly Father, we pray for your blessings upon us on this most solemn yet very emotional moments as we bid farewell to a Grand Lady of the Sea, USS John F. Kennedy. At this time, we pay respect and tribute to every sailor who sailed on her on the high seas in times of war and peace for the last 39 years. We express our gratitude for the preservation of the ship from the dangers of the sea and the violence of the enemy and for bringing her safely to this hour. With her continued blessing, she has brought great honor to our nation, to her namesake, and to the tens of thousands of sailors who stood the watch on her decks. Grant, O oh God, your blessing and protection on all men and women who have served in our Navy around the world. Make us truly strive to be instruments of peace in a distrustful world. Finally, O oh God, unite us all in an eternal purpose to preserve and bear aloft the torch of freedom and peace among nations that USS John of Kennedy honorably did for 39 years. To thy honor and glory, we offer this prayer. Amen.
retire the colors. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our ceremony, the decommissioning of the John F. Kennedy. After the departure of the official party, guests, participants, and crew are invited to join Captain Zekin for refreshments in the reception area off to your right. Adjutant, take charge. Carry out the plan of the day. Aye, aye, sir. Division officers, return. Wow. Dave, you mean to tell me there's not a single member of the United States Navy aboard that ship at this moment? Well, I will, somebody I will the Navy say on there, there's absolutely someone on board. Uh, we have we know Channel 4's Casey Black is still on we, the ship. We still have members that have to maintain some of the equipment. So we have folks on board. And that's unfortunate that not everyone could take part, have a visible part in this ceremony today. But one of the interesting things that you mentioned, Dave, is that the radar tower actually stops. And when you've been out to Mayport and you've seen the Kennedy in port, and you, one of the things that you notice the most is that radar tower spinning round and round. And if you take a look at it now, it has come to a standstill. Also, the pennants have come down as well. Yes, it's sad. You know, I thought, I really believe that at the end of this day, that uh, I would feel somewhat satisfied because of all the preparation that myself and this great crew has put into the ship. I don't feel sat uh, satisfied at all. I feel sad. It hasn't hit me yet that when you look at this ship, I still see a warship. I still see something capable. But the truth is, it's not. And we have to accept that and move on. Throughout the time you have been watching us here at uh, Channel 4, we have been proud to present to you coverage of the decommissioning ceremony of the John F. Kennedy. Sam Kuvaris has been mingling with the crowd, talking to some very interesting people. Sam, what, did, what was your take on the ceremony today? Very, as you mentioned, Stacy, very solemn uh, ceremony and uh, a lot of sadness among uh, the uh, people who served aboard uh, JFK. Uh, particularly, I think it's very poignant that um, a lot of people understand the uh, the ceremony that uh, obviously that the Navy goes through in a lot of situations, whether it's a change of command or a decommissioning like this. Uh, when the captain departed, they don't name the captain. They just say, John F. Kennedy departing. The captain is the ship. And uh, uh, it's uh, very poignant, I think, that... Uh, that when he uh, finally stepped off and stepped off the, as you mentioned, the ceremonial quarter deck there, that uh, the ship was officially decommissioned and he, in essence, was the uh, the last officer to, uh, to to stand down, so to speak, after eight bells. So it's um, uh, a lot of people, um, uh, you know, it's it's uh, while it's a celebration, 
as you've mentioned several times, it's a very solemn and uh, a sad time for a lot of people who spent uh, a lot of their lives and got a lot of life experiences here on the JFK. Casey Black is uh, is still with us, in fact, and uh, is still on board. Casey, are you the are you the last person there? Yeah. You know what, Sam? I am the last person on the flight deck. At one point in time, they were manning the rails. There were uh, quite a few sailors out here in their dress blues, and as you can see now. Uh, the deck has been completely cleared. Of course, this was part of the decommissioning ceremony as you watch there live as all the sailors, not all, but most of the sailors aboard the USS John F. Kennedy filed off one after another. And if you take a look off to uh, my left, your right, you can see the sailors are going off to uh, get a few refreshments with the commanding officer, Zekman, and you can see the band continues to play. And, and being up here on the flight deck, you had an interesting perspective of the day. You were looking down upon everything that was happening. You saw uh, Commander Zekin, of course, um, bidding his farewell to this ship. And it was a it was a sad moment. It, it started off very somber. But at the flip side of it, it's also a kind of a happy moment that you're seeing a close uh, of a great performance of a ship more than 40 years of service, more than 11 years here. And so really, it was, it was a neat moment, a sad one to say. But uh, as we say, our final goodbye to Big John. I'm going to send it now to uh, Tom and Stacy, who are standing by. <laughs> As Mrs. Crenshaw said in her speech, the Kennedy has loved Jacksonville and Mayport, and Mayport and Jacksonville have loved the Kennedy. Dave, talk with us about the relationship between the Navy and between this city. Well, as you know, the Navy has been embarked, and I say that lightly, embarked on this city since before World War II. You know, the relationship, the roots go go to every, every corner of Jacksonville, and even further deep, uh, deeper south in St. John's County and north. I can tell you that I've spent, and I told you this earlier, and I'm going to put myself on report, 20 years in Jacksonville. And I cannot go out in the community in Jacksonville and not find someone that I've served with or at least understands and appreciates what we do. So there's a huge tie and commitment by this community to the Navy, and we're very grateful for that. And so many people who retire from the Navy retire to Jacksonville, and they could retire any place in the world, any place in the country that they wanted to, and yet they come here. I think that's why. <laughs> oh, oh, it's the sunshine, Dave. That's what you all like, the same thing we like. Also hearing Captain Zekin describe the conditions up in Massachusetts when those uh, repairs needed to be made 20, deg 20 degrees below zero and yeah. 35 mile an hour winds. Well, there is a lot of benefit of living here in Florida. Of course, the community takes us in. We love it. I love Florida pro primarily because of the community and the atmosphere and the weather, to be honest with you. It was startling to see our sailors, our, our Jacksonville-based sailors, wearing their pea coats up there in uh, Boston. We don't see the pea coats on them very often. <laughs> You know, what's surprising is, is that a lot of sailors had to go out and buy pea coats because they've been down <laughs> they here too long in Florida. Them. Well, Lieutenant Commander Dave Scalf, it's been Thank our you. honor to be able to get your insight this morning. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. God bless you. Bless you, too. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us for Channel 4's coverage of the decommissioning of the John F. Kennedy. Thanks for watching, everybody. Look.